Brittany. <laughs> Let's start this slow. <laughs> Who are you? So you know what, Zach? Um, I uh, absolutely like appreciate like even the simple like phrasing of that. Like who who are you? Because part of like the past few months, like the work that I've really been disrupting, and I'm gonna get to the who are you, but I want to give you all this framing. Um, part of the work these past few months that I've been engaging in personally has really been disrupting like this lie that colonialism and like anti-blackness has told me that my body is like a tool for production. And so I usually lead with like what I do for this answer. I usually lead with that. And I have legit been like unlearning this notion that what I do validates like who I am, right? Really been resistant and like nine that. So to answer that question, I am Brittany J. Harris. Emphasis on Brittany, three syllables. Um, my mom, a few weeks ago, actually when I launched my brand site, this was the first time I actually had my family and like colleagues and community. And she was like, um, Brit, I'm going to need you to hold your colleagues accountable to the fact that I name you Brittany, like Brittany Spears. I named you Brittany. And so I've been honoring my, my mother these days more intentionally in how I introduce myself. And so Brittany J. Harris, Brittany Janae, um, I am a creative. There's a quote by Lucille Clifton that I have been like reflecting on of late. And you'll notice that I reference Lucille Clifton, poet, writer, all around like Black woman magic quite a bit in my work. But she says, I don't write from a place of having answers than I do from a place of wonder. And that resonates with me so much because I actually consider myself a perpetual wonderer. Like, I feel like I'm always in this, this like seat of curiosity, hella questions, um, with intent to like disrupt and maybe even challenge when necessary. And so I consider myself a healthy <laughs> disruptor. Um, I'm a black woman, a mother, a nurturer to two black boys. I am a daughter to two teenage parents who uh, like really did their thing to like cultivate a, a culture of love and how they raised my brother and I. And I offer that because that love shows up in how I show up in, in this work even. I'm a granddaughter, you know, to Lula B and Lula uh, Lewis, Lucille and Elmer. My grandfather is the son of sharecroppers. And so, you know, that phrase when they say, oh, we're our ancestors' wildest dreams. Like, I'm legit, y'all. Like, my grandparents' wildest dreams. And I've been reflecting more on, like, even how my grandparents have, like, shaped how I show up as a practitioner and even, like, this new lane and path that I find myself on. And a story came to me that I'm going to share, and it'll come full circle in a bit. But I remember, I probably had to be in like second, third grade. I had posed a question for my, um, to my father. At the time, we were living in Baltimore City, but he and my mom were like trying to, you know, move us up one out. And so we were on our way to moving into the suburbs. And around that same time, or like shortly thereafter, my grandparents were struggling financially. And so it became really apparent to me even at that young age, the difference between like where I was at that time, where we were, that environment, and where my family was um, actually from. Um, and so that difference between like living in the city and moving to the suburbs, being a little bit more around white folks. And I remember really being challenged by it at a young age. And I think that's where this like perpetual wonder comes into play. I remember being challenged by like, why my grandparents got to struggle? Like why my family got to struggle with white folks? you know, got it. You know, white folks are rich. And I, I even remember bringing in, asking my father the question and connecting it back to faith. Like, why would God make that so? I offer this because it's, it's very similar to what um, James Baldwin has this essay, A Talk to Teachers, where he talks about how children begin to like learn systems of inequity and dehumanization, especially black children, just by nature of their environmental surroundings. Like we start to actually question, okay, why is that like that over there? And why is that different from where I am? 
we start to believe like things that society say and like show us. And so when I think about the question, like, who are you? Like, I am someone who, with that context in mind, wants Black people and Black children to know that they are not deficient, that we are not defective, that we are not invalid, that we are not less than, even when these structures suggest otherwise. I'm someone who wants Black folks to know that it is hella problematic that we actually have to prove ourselves to be worthy of things like housing and education and employment, right? Um, I'm someone who wants us to know that we are inherently worthy and deserving. And when I think back to that story, I'm someone who wants like my second greater self to know that it wasn't necessarily that my grandparents, right, that grams and pops did anything wrong or that they were any less deserving or any less worthy, that we weren't any better just because we was about to move up out of there, right? I'm someone who wants that second grader self to like come to know and understand like these systems and structures are like really jacked up and that's not us, right? And so I share all of that because um, all of that has brought me to me also being the creator of liberated love notes, right? Critical self-reflections and affirmations for the culture. I feel like that was long drawn out, um, but I feel like that context is important. Um, I feel it like <laughs> that's who I am and they have nothing to do with it. And, and, and it's fascinating to me to even like speak that back out because it has nothing to do with like, like what I do. Right. And that level of just like clarity for me has been huge. So first of all, it was long, but it was needed and it was helpful. Mm. Mm-hmm. And that's okay, right? Like it's it was the appropriate length for what was needed. <laughs> uh-huh. So you know, it's a, you know, it's a culture thing too. Like, so the more I come into my understanding of of self, right, the more I come into my understanding of like who we are as a collective. And so it is absolutely our communication style. People of the African and Black diaspora tend to be less linear in how we tell stories. We use images, right? Um, we bring in context, which, I mean, you, you talk about all of that. I mean, you consider that in a corporate environment and that can, that can go. That's, that's why there are more often than not like challenges and, and ways we have to like contort ourselves because it's sometimes, sometimes what is inherently in us just doesn't resonate, nor is it valuable. So, so yeah, I've come to learn that in as much as uh, who I am is who I am, it is also part of something, you know. It's just, it's in me, right? Yeah, it's, it's, me, deep, so. it's something mm-hmm. deeper. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so look, we are going to talk about liberated love notes. I mean, like that's the, that's the title of this entire thing we got going on that you have going on, but let's talk about what it is you actually do for a living as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so by day and sometimes by night, I am a vice president of learning and innovation with the Winters Group. Uh, The Winters Group is a global diversity, equity, inclusion, justice consulting firm. Y'all might already know Black owned, Black led, Black founded by Mary Frances Winters. Um, We actually just celebrated 37 years in the game. That's something. What? 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 Talk about doing the work, sustaining the work and building. Uh, So in my role, I'm primarily responsible for leading the team that is responsible for like designing all of our learning experiences uh, that really seek seek to shift perspectives and facilitate connection, hopefully empower action around equity, justice and inclusion. And as much as the recent environment, right, the the, the backdrop of all that is going on has called for many organizations to evolve their DEI work into one that centers justice, I just want to name that we're not new to this. We are true to this. About four years ago, uh, or four or five years ago, we really started to do work around mapping the intersection between uh, corporate DEI and social justice work. Uh, and so I am very proud to say that in as much as, you know, the DEI mainstream 
is oftentimes not without critique and that it absolutely centers whiteness. A lot of times it has been grounded in, you know, the implicit biases and the, you know, just the cultural competence and the feel goods of belongingness. Work that is necessary and without a power analysis means absolutely, you know, nothing. We have been approaching the work in that way. Um, and so, yeah, I am a, you know, I still consider myself a DEI practitioner. I will say over the last, and I may have shared this with you a few times, Zach, over the last couple of months, maybe even year, I've been in deep reflection on just how I understand DEI in relation to, you know, purpose versus profession and like all the things. Um, I've been thinking about DEI, what it means to be Black in DEI and how that is a an additional toll, a very unique experience in that not only are you trying to do the work to uh, minimize harm and resolve, resolve the trauma that is imposed on Black and brown folks by these systems, as a Black person, this work can inherently be re-traumatizing. And so uh, that has been something I've been thinking about a lot. I shared with someone recently after hearing this from a community healer, she said she, she, she categorized or referred to DEI as the necessary harm reduction work, right? That means to an end work that is necessary while we exist in these systems, but it absolutely will not save and heal us, right? And so, uh, you know, it's some necessary work. And I'm very clear that there is work that we have to do as Black folks. When, so when I say we, we have to do as Black folks in community that is beyond the scope of a lot of the, like, you know, mainstream DEI conversations and work and, and all the things. So that's what I do. And that's what I love. And I appreciate the folks who I am in community with, often consultants, obviously our instructional designers, and even our clients with really good intentions. Um, and yet the work doesn't stop there, right? The work doesn't stop there. So, you know, you and I talk. I consider mm -hmm. us friends. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy the work that we do together. I enjoy the conversations we have. But why are we here right now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in short, right, I'm trying to build... You know, we trying to build, uh, live in corporate. So first of all, I was reflecting on like, okay, when did I first come to know um, and understand or be familiar with live in corporate? And I realized that like, in as much as I think I hit you up maybe last year or the year before, the first live, live in corporate episode um, that I listened to, I was actually in San Francisco in 2018. And it's crazy. And so I'm so here I am. It's gonna come full circle. I'm just I'm I just wanna like just a little a little anecdote on manifestation, right? <laughs> and this came to me like out the blue, which is what uh, just how my mind works. I was at the airport in San Francisco in 2018 at a client site, and I can't remember how. Um, and it was I think at a time when it was it was two, it was y'all, it was it was you and a, I think another gentleman. Um, holding a conversation with a black executive. I can't remember where it was from, but I remember thinking to myself, like, you know what? This is, um, I want to, like, I at some point just want to be aligned because I remember feeling like real full um, after listening to the episode and being drawn to how the platform was being used to uh, really amplify black and brown you know, voices, communities, experiences, all the things. And so um, that's one thing. Why am I here? When I think about where I am right now and wanting to build um, liberated love notes, um, center my practice and work around what I feel Black and Black people need, um, what we are deserving of, I want to do that in partnership and in community. And so today is really all about us, at least from my perspective, like, like a meeting of the minds of sorts and leveraging living corporate to really uplift what liberated love notes is and will be. 
Um, I want to use Liberated Love Notes live as a way to really scale and foster this collective consciousness, right? Um, and community, right? So the short answer is to that, I'm here to uh, really take Liberated Love Notes in partnership with Living Corporate to our community, the community who I know is already actively engaged with, um, a community that is reflective of, you know, who I am, who we are, and, you know, would benefit from this work. I love it. I love it. And, you know, we've, we've said the phrase a few times, what is liberated love notes? And maybe for context, what does liberation mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's good because I be spending, I, and I realized too, hold then hold me accountable. I realized I be I, sometimes I be sharing, spitting out terms, not even uh, without even offering like common language. And so, there's a really good friend of mine, colleague in this work, and she, uh, Kiala Jacques, another Black woman. I love her definition of liberation, and she defines it as showing up as the fullest expression of oneself uninterrupted and there is something about that uninterrupted qualifier that like <laughs> it just hit different it hit different zach and so uninterrupted by like problematic norms uninterrupted by the white imagination uninterrupted by uh messages and narratives that would suggest we need to do this this and that before we are like worthy of right when i think about liberation i think about black people's inherent right emphasis on inherent right, to like make our own decisions, build our own communities, um, affirm our own identities and experiences unapologetically, right, uh, our inherent right to heal and reimagine a world and spaces and structures beyond whiteness. When I think about liberation, I think about leveraging our own inherent brilliance to solve for our own problems without the need for permission. Um, when I think about the state of liberation, I think about this state of when who we are is enough, right? Like this, this like collective being and like knowing there's another, and I emphasis this being, this being piece because there's another, um, oh, there's another quote by Lucille Clifton that I love and y'all, when I, uh, let me just, I'll, 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 I'll share I really be feeling like and truly believe that our ancestors like show up in just how we move and like, you know, connect with us and um, a lot of what they've experienced and left behind ends up being embodied in us. And so I be feeling real connected to Lucille Clifton, y'all. If y'all don't know her, get to know her. But there's this quote where she says, in the bigger scheme of things, the universe is not asking us to do something. The universe is asking us to be something. And that's a whole different thing. And so I, I, I see liberation as this like state of being, right? Where we are absolutely enough. And so to answer your follow-up question, liberated love notes are affirmation statements that really get at, I think I was um, saying like disrupting injected oppression, really get at uh, building up our capacity to exist in uh, white spaces, toxic spaces. Um, liberated love notes um, include statements that put us in a position to begin to intentionally just build a healthier racial identity. I actually started writing them, one, just for my own personal practice, because even though I exist in and work for a Black-owned institution, as Still experience white supremacy every day, right? And so I, I, I needed something for myself, right? And so I ended up writing statements that um, not only affirmed who I was or who I am, but also hold me accountable. They were also in response to just some of the things that my peers and my family and my friends would share as it related to their experience in some of these spaces. Um, Self-reflection from my perspective is a huge part or should be a huge part of our own personal practice. And so uh, Liberated Love Notes include self-reflection questions. I think the work, all of this work needs to be done in community. So there are like group discussion prompts. Um, what makes it all the more special though, is obviously they were written by myself, so a black woman, 
They were designed by a black woman. They were even edited, y'all, by a black woman. And so, you know, all kinds of love, right? I actually shared one today, just so I can make it real practical. One of the liberated love notes that I shared today um, was in response to one of my good girlfriends. And we won't take a, a, a deep dive on this topic today, but she's like, you know, Brittany, like, Brittany, do you want everyone to just like leave their jobs in corporate America or something? Like, is that what you want us all to do? And I was like, nah, like, I really want, I, don't, I know that's not practical. Like, I know that it's very difficult. Capitalism is real. Like, we're not only caring for our families, but like households, the wealth, the wealth gap is real. And yet we have the responsibility to exist in these systems with greater clarity. It's just not enough to be, for lack of better words, playing the game um, on autopilot. And then like perpetuating all kinds of, you know, internalized oppression and things. And so one of the liberated love notes that I offered um, is around our worth and proximity to white institutions. And it reads, my worth and legitimacy are not dictated by white institutions. My allegiance is and will always be to my community the Black community, even when I am working within the context of white systems. And uh, that level of consciousness, awareness, and intentionality, from my perspective, clarity is necessary for us to continue to not just like survive, but thrive in these systems, right? Because if we ain't clear, we end up, I think you posted it a while ago, Zach, like, uh, what was it? Like, you think you playing the game, but you really playing the stuff. even know and we big playing yourself (laughs) wait we 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 owe ourselves more right we can do better we deserve better so um that's what uh yeah that's what liberated love notes are my way to i hate the term normalize but like my way to support us right and realizing liberation for ourselves even while we deal with the realities of whiteness in the day to day, right? Because yeah, I'm telling you, DEI is not going to save us, right? It, it's not. It just, no. it just it just ain't going to save us. We, well, we've seen well, we've seen we've seen 15 years of, of supposed supposed effort and intentional uh, engagement in this space, and and we've and yet these transparency reports look exactly the same. So and, and exactly, and to the point now where, and this has nothing to do with this, but I mean, hey, like. Institution like transparency ain't even nothing anymore. Like everybody released the data, and it is just kind of like, oh, okay, it is abs. It- <laughs> data be terrible. They be like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like yo. It's, 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 so yes, the uh, will that save us? It's it's so interesting enough. I was I was facilitating a session, a couple. What was this last week? And someone had asked me like, well, do you think that um, you know. We can really can we really reverse colonialism? Can we really reverse white supremacy? And this is a black woman. I had to be real transparent with sis in that, like, yeah, that's just that's not my work. You know what I mean? Like, um, I don't I don't know that that is really within the scope, the immediate scope of my influence right now. And and I do believe that in community as black folks, we can do the work to heal from white supremacy. We can do do the work to heal from colonialism. We can create containers where we're really intentional about that on our own. Because I just don't know if I can say authentically and with conviction that the practice of DEI is going to get us sort of like what we need, right? And like you said, the years of whatever, however long this has been formalized as a, a body of work, proves it so right and so let's do the absolutely continue to do the, the harm reduction work necessary and let's be very very clear about uh what our personal work and practice should be grounded in if our end goal is you know liberation right i love it i love it so so britain Brittany. My mom is gonna smile when she hears that, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> we're thankful for you. We're excited about this. So, so let's talk about, you know, where can folks learn more about you? Live, you know, this is, this is essentially episode zero. But mm-hmm. where can folks learn more about you as we get ready 
to air the first official episode, like where can folks kind of tap in and check in? Yeah, I feel like um, I'm Brittany Janae everywhere. And so Brittany Janae.com. I feel really excited to share that on my birthday. And so February 17th, uh, I actually launched like my, my brand site, which I'm really um, excited about. It is, it has been, so that's where you can find me, my thoughts, liberated love notes, the things I think about, the work that I am doing, some of the products and resources that are for us, by us, will absolutely be there. And so that's pr- that's prime. I want to share that you can absolutely find more there. But I'm also Brittany Janae on Instagram and Twitter. Um, but I think on Instagram is actually Brittany Janae underscore. Um, and obviously here, right? I'm really excited, Zach, for how Liberated Love Notes Live will evolve and really excited to just like build with, right? Be in community with you and the rest of the folks on Living Corporate. So, so yeah. That's dope. All right. Well, look, Brittany, we're going to talk to you soon. Excited for you to be here. Listen, y'all, um, I'm just always honored and excited about Living Corporate and the things that we're doing and how we're growing and the incredible people that decide to uh, to, to journey with us, right? So, uh, look, Liberated Love Notes is a podcast airing weekly, coming to you very soon. In the meantime, make sure you share this episode, give it five stars, and uh, catch y'all later. Peace.